Um, as far as vulnerability management, I really try to look at it from uh, an organic place across um, just people as a whole. I focus on social engineering, so of course the first thing that I think of is educating the public about um, things as simple as oversharing online, uh, whether it's about themselves personally or about their companies, and really opening up those avenues to threat actors to gain information that can allow them to advance their attacks to more critical information and uh, credentials and things like that. So I think for me, if we train people to be aware in their personal life and uh, understand the threats that are out there and how to mitigate those, they're going to carry those skills forward into work. And I think that this isn't just a specific problem with employees and the work side of things, but if we educate the whole person how to keep their kids safe, how to keep themselves safe, they're going to carry that that behavior and those uh, those um, processes over into their work as well. So from a patch management perspective, things just kind of get pushed off and pushed off and pushed off because there's no there's no process in place. There's no mandate from the top that says you're going to maintain this level of compliance with current standards or with current uh, releases of things. Right. The processes that you use and the direction you take in your change management has to be thought out ahead of time when you develop a product when you develop a process how am I going to maintain it All right we're here at RSA and everybody's telling me well our our XYZ widget service costs ten dollars per seat and I said well that's nice but you're not considering the cost for me to maintain that to configure the software to have a person do all of the things that go with that great web interface you gave me to manage that widget right so there's other costs and other time involved and if you don't take that time up front, you're going to get burned in the end because what's going to happen is over time, all of these vulnerabilities are going to stack up and you'll never be able to catch up. So what you have to do is prioritize vulnerabilities. Look at the ones that are most likely to be exploited, that are the highest impact for the person that, or thing that might be exploiting those vulnerabilities, and use your time to patch and fix those vulnerabilities and exposures first to reduce your risk profile. You're not gonna get them all, but if you can sort them out such that you're getting after the ones that have the highest risk to your organization, you're gonna be better off. Well, vulnerability management affects everyone, whether or not they write their own software or create their own hardware, because you run technology, and technology, even that you didn't create, has flaws in it that you have to keep up with. I think that an important part of vulnerability management is understanding, one, asset management, asset uh, you know classification. Um, but I also think that since there are a lack of skilled folks, a great way for an organization to start changing their vulnerability management um, is to let people do some security scanning, whether it's internal folks or inviting hackers to do so and see where their posture is, that gives them a really good sense of how quickly can they address the vulnerabilities that are out there in the world. Um, and I think that also looking at improving the ROI, um, you know, the NIST, uh, NIST, there was a NIST study many, many years ago um, that said that Fixing vulnerabilities in the design phase was 45 times cheaper than fixing vulnerabilities after code is released. So, I mean, the best ROI investments can only start when you actually measure your effectiveness and capabilities in handling vulnerabilities you already know about. You have no business opening the front door and offering money to hackers if you essentially lack a bug digestive system. It's like going to an all-you-can-eat bug buff buffet and it's not gonna work out very well for you. In some ways, our industry and our society is sort of fixated on vulnerability. Uh, like that's the only thing. Uh, and I think that comes from, I was classically trained in terms of what was called a risk equation. Uh, and risk very loosely, you know, there's lots of formulas and people try to figure out the actual mathematical uh, algorithms, but simplistically risk is a function of the vulnerabilities that exist in your environment, the threats to your environment, and what you do to what we call mitigate or have as a countermeasure to the fact that you have vulnerabilities and threats. So all that all wraps together in some mathematical formula to give you a risk. Um, 
in that perspective, vulnerabilities is a variable in an equation, threats are a variable in an equation, and countermeasures or mitigations are a variable in, a, in, in this equation that gives you some measure of risk. Uh, I think people look at that and in a classical sense they say, well, threats are kind of out there. They're, they're ever present. They're, they're sort of more or less a constant. The countermeasures, well, those are things we can do, but we can only do so much. But the thing that I think people think is the, the variable that they can impact the most is vulnerabilities. And, and the general goal is if you lower anything in the, in the, in the algorithm, that's going to reduce your risk, lower your risk. So I think we have a fixation on vulnerabilities almost to the detriment of considering the other things that are out there. Um, and we also tend to rely and focus very much on the technology aspect of vulnerabilities. And there's so many other vulnerabilities that are out there in terms of people and processes. Um, I, I was having a conversation on Twitter a couple weeks ago and I was asking some question about vulnerability management and somebody, and I, I apologize, I forget who they were, otherwise I would have given them a shout out, said something about, because uh, I think I, it came around to like, what's your favorite vulnerability scanner or what's your best vulner, you know, what's your, what do you think is the best vulnerability scanner? And somebody said, my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, that's me. I love that. So I, I'm hopefully with their permission, permission, I'm adopting this mantra that my brain is my favorite vulnerability scanning tool. Um, yeah, and the problem with, with patching is that it, it's probably the most disruptive thing you can do to an IT environment. And yet, uh, on the security side, it's viewed as something that should happen immediately, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, and of course, anybody on the operations side knows, <laughs> no, let's make sure it doesn't break anything first. So, <clears throat> so yeah, it, it's this constant, uh, and it's always going to be a balance, I think, of, uh, you know, making sure that things are going to run smoothly, you know, but you can secure them as well. So you have to think about things like um, what happens when that fails. Uh, because when you're never going to hit 100%, uh, you're going to have more than 0% failure. Uh, you know, when somebody does get in through something that wasn't patched, are you prepared for that? Um, you know, typically exploiting a vulnerability doesn't mean you're, you've instantly had a breach. You know, that attacker has to then take another step, find what they're looking for. They don't know what your environment looks like. They've got to search around. And these are all opportunities to catch them. That, that's what Thinks does with the, with the canary is uh, we're hoping to catch them on, on step two. You know, step, they've already gotten in and, and we're looking for those exploration techniques. You know, so you need those uh, kind of second tier plans uh, to, uh, you know, to then stop somebody once they've gotten in. So I like to say, um, you know, design as if there's always a zero day vulnerability and a patch is never coming. And if you design for that, if you design to, uh, to handle those issues when they happen, uh, then you're much more prepared, you sleep better at night, and, and you have a lot more confidence in, in your security. Security configuration management and uh, vulnerability management are core bedrock must-dos. You know, and that's been true from the time that I was at NSA. So what I did at NSA, I spent my whole life in defense, but working on security testing. So I came up kind of in the math uh, field, but then switched to computer science. So I got to be part of the very earliest days of uh, red team testing, blue team testing, and all that. Right. So going out, you know, teams around the world looking at DoD systems, intelligence community systems, and finding problems, right, and reporting on them. And of course, you, it's no surprise, right? You see the same old problems over and over and over again. And out of that came things like the earliest versions of what we called back then the NSA security guides. So think of them as the moral equivalent and actually predecessor of CIS benchmarks. Uh, they're equivalent to a DISA STIG, a security technical implementation guide, and NIST calls them security checklists. Right. Well, ours were based upon security testing. Right. So there was no group, there was no budget, there was no special product line. It was we were capturing lessons learned from going out to look at real life systems in the DoD, which are you know 80, 90 percent like everybody else's, with a sprinkling of uh, unique vertical applications, right? Specialty applications for, for special things that the only Defense Department does. But the idea was to start to codify these configuration lessons. And, you know, we originally did it to train our people, 
right? And then it became, well, let's put it into kind of a booklet, right? Well, the booklet became something, well, we don't have time to come visit you this month or this quarter or this year. Take this. This is what we would test against. So this idea of configuration management just had, took on a life of its own because, in our view, it was so important, right? That is, most of the things, bad things that happened or that we postulated could happen, you could actually deal with most of them uh, through configuration management. And as an experiment, I can remember this very clearly, I think, it, I'm pretty certain it was, it was uh, January of 2000. So uh, this is back in, back in the Bronze Age. Um, it was, you know, so for many of us, right, the end of the year, you, you uh, do a quick spin through all the year-end summaries that vendors put out or that come out through, you know, uh, think tanks and places like that. So I'm, I'm pretty certain it was year 2000 was the first year that Microsoft hit uh, three digits in security bulletins. Okay, 100 security bullets, right? And of course, there were a number of editorials. Oh, the world's going to end, you know, terrible, terrible, terrible. So I'm looking at, at that and I thought, wow, here we are, you know, 100 security bulletins, and we're giving all this NSA security guidance out, right? These very specific how to configure, you know, kind of things. So I called in the chief of the blue team. I said, what can I tell our customers for the NSA um, r relative to the guidance we give out vis a vis? 100 security bulletins. What's the story? If you uh, pay attention to our guidance, hey, we take care of all that for you, or hey, uh, we saw all those bulletins, we promise 30 days after every bulletin comes out, we will update our guidance if it's appropriate, blah, blah. What's the story? And they looked at me like, we don't know. We never thought about that. <laughs> right? In good faith, they were reading all that stuff, just like everybody else was, translating it right under the hood without sharing that with anybody, but saying, okay, we see all these bad things that are happening in our testing. We see what Microsoft is saying about you know, things that they're fixing or patches that, that come out. How do we translate that into positive, constructive guidance? And um, they went back and looked at it and spent like a, you know, an afternoon or a day kind of back, back of the envelope calculation. And it turned out a astounding number of problems that had been reported in the last year were actually dealt with very neatly by configuration management. I mean, you know, your classic 80% kind of problems, right? And so I, I made them do that experiment a few times. Again, this is not rigor. This is smart people just sort of back of the envelope. I thought, why aren't we telling anybody that? Right? Why? And it wasn't always, the answer isn't always perfect, right? That it says, if you, if you set this configuration item, this bad thing will never happen. Many times it was about minimizing the effect of a bad thing. Right. So, so things like uh, managing administrative privilege, you might not be able to stop the initial vector, but it won't go any further. Right. If you don't let processes write to these directories, you know, you can. So you get the opportunity to both prevent things, but also prevent their spread, uh, detect them. Right. They become visible, and so you get a lot of benefit from that. So long story, but for me. You know, it really emphasized good configuration management, scanning for the known bad things. If you can't manage the known bad, I'm not sure what you're going to do against the unknown bads, frankly. So those, th those have value in and of themselves, right? You need to do them. If you can do them well, it also tells you a lot about your IT management. That is, you can do that. You, you, you automatically have a good handle on the hardware that you own, right? That's, that's visible on your network. You have, you have to do a good jo uh, job on knowing what software is installed, what state it's in, you know, uh, the, the environment around it, and when things change, right? So it, it implies a lot under the hood, and that's why these control frameworks can be kind of complicated because not everyone accounts for that. They say, oh yeah, yeah, and by the way, you ha you have to manage all this stuff, um, you know, and the, to get better security. So, but you know, that's kind of the bottom line for me. That has always been the core. Again, both for the value that you get, but also for what it implies about your ability to manage your IT.